Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 11th of June and this quick look ahead at the week beginning the 14th of June with me, Michael Hewson. Before we get started, just have to do a couple of risk warnings, but um, it's been a little bit of a strange week this week, if truth be told, because I think most of the week we've spent pretty much treading water, searching for a little bit of direction for equity markets, albeit with a slightly upward bias. Ultimately, while we struggle to, to go anywhere, there hasn't really been any downward momentum pushing down on equity markets. And the FTSE 100 looks to be on course to finish the week higher, even if European markets more broadly have been struggling. And we've seen another record high for the S&P 500. So it's you know as far as equity markets is concerned, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, nonetheless, um, it's certainly been an interesting week when it comes to the, the two key events of this week, which I think most investors had been focusing on, namely the European Central Bank meeting on Thursday, but also the US CPI numbers. Um, which provoked a rather odd response. Um, a rather strange thing happened um, after US CPI hit its highest levels since 2008 at 5%, um, bond yields went down. Um, core CPI hit its highest level since 1992, 3.8%, which sort of brings me on to the main focus, I think, really, of this week's this week's video, because next week or the, in, in the next few days, we've got the latest Fed meeting. And I think it's going to be very instructive um, as to what effect Federal Reserve policymakers will make of the big jumps that we've seen in inflation, because I think judging by the reaction of bond markets at the moment, um, bond investors, I think, seem remarkably sanguine about the prospects of inflation being transitory. Um, you know, the T word. It's being used quite a lot on financial TV, gets used an awful lot by central bankers and um, more broadly um, by investors as well. But for me, I think it is a concern. Um, you know, you, know, you can talk about base effects. You can talk about, obviously, the big decline that we saw um, this time last year um, or just over this time last year in commodity prices. But that was in March and April um, or April and May. Um, by the time June had come around, um, commodity prices were rebounding. So um, we were certainly off the, you know, we were certainly off the lows. There has been some evidence over the past few days, the commodity prices are starting to top out a little bit. So obviously that will bring us a little bit of relief, particularly when it comes to agricultural commodities. But I think what's more concerning more than anything else is, well, CPI is coming out higher than expected. Um, PPI numbers, which tend to be a forward-looking indicator, are also still rising, which suggests that while CPI is rising, the fact that PPI is still rising means that we've got at least another two or three months of potentially sticky inflation going forward. And I think the big debate at the moment is as to whether or not um, what is perceived to be transitory starts to become more persistent. And at the moment, bond markets appear to be buying the narrative that central banks are peddling, that um, the inflationary pressures that we're currently seeing are just a resetting of the status quo pre-pandemic. Let's just hope that they're right, because if they're not, then we could see a bit of a spike in bond yields. But certainly on the basis of this price action here, we can see that the, the lows are getting lower and the highs are getting lower. So that suggests to me, despite the fact that we've come such a long way since August last year, we do appear to have topped out and there is certainly potential Certainly on the basis of this chart here that I'm looking at, which is the US 10-year Treasury yield, on the basis of this chart here, 
that we could actually well find a little bit more weakness play out when it comes to US Treasury yields. And we could actually potentially come all the way back here to 1.35%. Certainly, I think that's a viable um, target, particularly if you look at it in the context of, say, for example, um, this move higher that we've got here. So we've come from 0.5% all the way up to 1.77%. We could even conceivably come all the way back to 1.2% which was the original breakout level in February of this ratchet higher all the way up to 1.8. So at the moment, on a technical basis, irrespective of what you think of the inflation numbers, um, on a technical basis, this 10-year this yield chart would appear to suggest that we could well see further weakness in yields. Now, that is likely to be very positive for stock markets. Certainly, we've seen that play out this week with respect to the S&P 500, which has once again hit a new record high. Um, hit it yesterday, currently trading in the pre-market here around about 42.40, um, with the prospect that we could well continue to edge up. And certainly on the basis of this chart, there's nothing to stop it from doing so, because if we look at the way the highs and the lows are behaving, very much the line of least resistance when it comes to the S&P 500. We are slowly trending higher. Um, and while we're above the 50-day moving average, which is obviously this red line here, then the bias remains towards the upside. But of course, as we look ahead towards next week, um, the upcoming week, we do have the small matter of the Federal Reserve rate meeting. We've also got US retail sales. Um, we've got UK retail sales. We've also got UK unemployment and UK CPI, as well as a couple of important earnings announcements in the form of Tesco's and Whitbread's first quarter numbers, which should give us a decent indication as to how um, the UK economy is doing vis-a-vis, -vis, um, obviously, supermarkets, but also Premier Inn um, and bookings and what have you. And um, as I say, we stayed in the Premier Inn a couple of two to three weeks ago now, um, when we went away for a week. And I um, have to say, the um, the service was pretty decent. So as a stopover visit on our on our way up to Scotland for um, a few days. Um, so I'll be having a quick look at the Whitbread and Tesco share price, as well as obviously looking ahead to the the key, the key, um, the key uh, support and resistance levels on the various indices. So we've gone with the S&P 500. We are now starting to look as if we, we're going to retest the highs on the FTSE 100. Um, managed to, we, we do appear to be now above these series of highs at 71.20, looking to retest the peaks of last month around about 71.60, 71.65, with a view to heading towards 7,200. I'm still of the opinion that the FTSE 100 has plenty of room to go higher. There has been some speculation that the UK government may delay the reopening of the economy, the UK economy, on the 21st of June. And while that has seen a little bit of weakness in airlines and travel stocks, um, I think as long as it's only a week or two, then I don't think it'll alter the overall economic picture too much. The latest GDP numbers out from the UK economy in April showed economic growth of 2.3% following on from the 2.1% that we saw in March. So May should be a similarly decent number. We've also got um, UK retail sales, which are due out on Friday. We've got unemployment numbers. Um, against that backdrop, the pound has continued to look fairly well supported. So we can look at the pound in the overall context because at the moment um, that's really been range trading, um, particularly uh, particularly against the dollar. If we look at the sterling index here, we've got a series of peaks all the way through 10.20. I st I'm, still a, I'm still minded to think that we've got the potential for further upside in the pound against the dollar. And that would be, I think that would be a natural outcome if we saw further declines in US Treasury yields. Um, you know, if we see a move below 1.4 on the US 10-year, 
then we could well see further sterling strength. But as we can see from this chart here, the 142.40 level is a really key level, I think, in the short to medium term. It's this, it's the highest this year. Um, I'm still of the opinion we can head back to 145. I think as long as we can hold above 140 and a half on the on the short term, these series of lows through here. More importantly, I think is the 140 level. I think if we can hold above 140, then I think the for me the line of least resistance is for a move towards 145 over the course of the next few weeks. I've you know I've been bullish the pound for quite some time. I see no reason to change my view on that. And that really, I think, brings us towards euro sterling as well. Again, there has been some evidence that perhaps we might see a little bit of euro strength. Um, I'm not convinced of that myself. The bigger level, I think, on euro sterling is 87.30, but we do have a significant area of resistance at around the highs this week, which is around about 86.40, 86.50. At the moment, we're trading in a bit of a range between 85.60 and 86.50. So for me, I think the bias is for a move lower back towards the lows that we saw at the beginning of April at 84.70 and potentially back to 84. Looking, looking at the way um, the, the economic data is going, I think the UK economy still has potential to jump an awful lot higher and regain an awful lot of the lost GDP that we've seen over the course of the past 12 months. An outgoing um, chief economist at the Bank of England, Andrew Haldane, is of the same view. Um, so much as it pains me to actually agree um, with a central banker, they're not normally right about anything. I think the fact that Mr Haldane is leaving probably means he's slightly freer to speak his mind and generally they tend to say what they think rather than tow the group think line. Um, so I think for me, I'm probably more bullish on the UK economy. Infection rates are lower here than they are in Europe. Obviously, I think you've also got concerns about the new Delta variant. Um, the fact that Europe is reopening when infection rates are higher, I think, is a bigger risk um, for them than it is, say, for the UK, where we've almost got herd immunity and maybe another couple of weeks, um, you know, you know if, even if the, the restrictions get extended for another couple of weeks, that should be enough for a much more broader economic reopening um, as we look towards July, August and September and the third quarter. So UK retail sales is due out on the 18th of June. Um, Expecting a little bit of a slowdown. Um, I think, if anything, I think the markets are potentially a little bit too pessimistic about retail sales for May. We had another stage of the economic reopening. We did see a big rise of 9.2% in the April numbers in the wake of the 12th of April easing. And I think, you know, further relaxation in May is likely to have given an additional boost to the numbers. And if last, you know, and if the recent BRC retail sales numbers are any sort of leading indicator, then we could well see another decent retail sales number in May. You know, as far as as far as the British Retail Consortium was concerned, total sales increased by 10% in May compared to 2019, and by more than the same number in April on a two-year basis, with clothing retailers the biggest beneficiaries of a return to the high street. Um, we also had um, consumers booking time away over the half term break. So that should be a net positive. And if recent May services PMIs are any guide, we could still see a fairly decent month for consumer spending in May. Um, unemployment numbers, again, it's not, you know, it's difficult to really set much store by them given the amount of people that are still on furlough. But this, I think there's still a fairly decent indicator um, of how how the economy is doing in terms of the net numbers employed now to the numbers a year ago. We do have UK CPI. Now, again, um, if you take Chinese CPI and US CPI as your benchmark, we're probably going to see another big jump in UK CPI. But I think more importantly, we won't see it 
move. We'll see it move closer to 2%, but I don't think we'll see it move above 2%. Um, in, in March, it came in, sorry, in April, it came in at 1.3, 1.5. Um, we've seen rising factory gate and commodity prices. Obviously, they're going to reinforce the concerns of a slightly higher number. Food prices generally haven't been showing any signs of upward pressure, I think, which is probably the most important narrative more than anything else. Um, so we could well see um, headline CPI jump from 8.1.5 to potentially uh, 1.7, 1.8, um, and core prices could jump to around about 1.5, 1.6. We could hit 2%, um, but as the Bank of England has shown in previous instances, they don't generally tend to react um, to inflation numbers jumping above their target rate. We saw that in 2011 when they did absolutely nothing when it jumped to 5% because they perceived it to be transitory when it was really anything but, but hey-ho. Um, this time is slightly different because obviously we saw a big price drop um, over 12 months ago. So I think it's gonna be easier for them to look through it. But overall, I don't expect it to move the dial too much when it comes to infl interest rate expectations that are potential um, pairing back of stimulus, even though I think we are getting to the point now where the Bank of England will come under pressure to rein back its, um, its um, bond buying program, um, its um, asset purchase program on a, uh, on a weekly and a monthly basis. They've, they've already started to do it already and I think the likelihood is, and the reason they've started to, to to basically slow down their bond purchases is to actually eke out the amount of bonds available into next year. But I have a feeling that they will probably have stopped well before then. So um, looking at Euro dollar, which I haven't looked at, I'm not really expecting too much of a change here. We're in very much a range trade, but we do appear to be starting to show signs of rolling over. And that's another reason why I think Euro sterling can go down, because while I think cable can go up, I'm not so nearly convinced of the case for a higher euro against the dollar. And this price action would appear to bear it out because we do appear to be rolling over. And, you know, if we look at the long shadows on these candles here, it would appear to suggest that it's very difficult to sustain buying interest near the highs of a particular day. That's not to say that we're going to come crashing off, but I certainly think there's potential for us to head back towards around about 120 and a half. If we can't get back above the highs that we saw earlier this week at 122.20. So 122.20, I think, is the key level for me. If we can stay below that, then we'll probably continue to drift back down take out the highs that we saw on the 4th of June last Friday and head back towards 120 and a half. Um, in terms of US retail sales, again, expecting a weaker number there <coughs> um, after, the, after the big gains that we've seen in the past, um, past couple of weeks, couple of weeks, couple of months, what am I saying? Past couple of months. April's number was actually um, a little bit weaker. Um, Unsurprisingly, after such a strong March number, the April numbers fell back sharply, coming in flat. Now, we were expecting a 1.1% rise for April retail sales for the US. We didn't get it. Um, and that's a disappointment. And if you actually look at the driving data for the US economy, US consumers are driving less, not more. Now, obviously, I think part and parcel of that has been due to the fact that there's been fuel shortages in some parts of the US. And that means that obviously if there's fuel shortages and you're not and you're concerned about filling up your car, you're not going to drive anywhere. Um, but um we've also we've also got the fact that um higher fuel prices are obviously tempering um people's appetite to travel, even though US theme parks have started to reopen, holiday parks have started to reopen and the vaccine rollout plans continuing to continuing a pace so i would suggest us retail sales you're probably going to see a little bit of a slowdown on the back of the fact that they did have fuel shortages for april 
and May as a result of the colonial pipeline problems and obviously the um, the, uh, the hacking attack there, which prompted fuel shortages at some US service stations. Okay, so as regards the Fed rate meeting, um, that is obviously going to be a key event risk when it comes to bond yields. And I think we'll, we may hear some more noises from some of the hawkish members of the FOMC, Robert Kaplan, for example. Um, he's already been suggesting that we could see a taper before the end of this year. And I think that's a, I think that's a sensible discussion to be having because even if you take the view that you're looking at an outcome-based data outcome when it comes to um, changing a monetary policy, and Che Powell, chairman of the Fed, has said that. He wants to see more evidence of a big jump in hiring. The fact that we've seen two weaker than expected payrolls reports doesn't really negate that. We've still seen numbers that are fairly decent. The only reason that I can see why hiring isn't jumping anywhere near as much as people had estimated is because of the um, extra unemployment benefits that are being paid out. If you look at the number of vacancies in the US economy, 9.2 million, it's a record high. They far outweigh the number of Americans that are out of work now than were out of work 14 months ago. That's 7 million higher. So you've got 7 million fewer, America, fewer Americans in the workforce than was the case pre-pandemic, and yet you've got 9.2 million vacancies. So the problem isn't workforce supply. It's the fact that an awful lot of these people either may not return to the workforce or may be quite happy to take their unemployment benefits while they're still available um, before they consider a return to the workforce. Now, that's not going to happen overnight. It could take another two or three months for that to play out. And certainly a number of U.S. states have suggested that they will end their unemployment benefits payouts in July um, and they'll completely finish in September. So we could have at least another two to three, four, th you know, th three, three, three months, another three months of below par jobs growth. Now, that's, you know, that's not going to basically um, move the Fed in the direction that perhaps we want it to. But certainly, I don't think there's any reason for the Fed to be buying $120 billion a month when you're looking at those sorts of numbers and you do have concerns about more persistent levels of inflation. I think the Fed can afford to taper without spooking the bond markets, but also giving a direction of travel that they are prepared to move as and when the data suggests it's sensible to do so. So um, in summary, um, line of least resistance, I think, in terms of US markets is for a slow drift higher. We are getting a little bit of stagnation in Europe, but we still managed to hit record highs this week for the DAX. Again, we're in a fairly decent uptrend for the DAX. So I wouldn't expect any of these dips to be particularly um, you know, to be particularly sharp. If we drop below the 50-day moving average and hold below the 50-day moving average, then I would have some concerns about that. But certainly on the basis of these charts here, we still remain very much of the opinion that um, it's, it's very much a buy the dip market. Certainly, if we look at the NASDAQ, what, has, what, we, what we've seen here is we've finally broken above this resistance level that I identified last week. And that would suggest that we're probably going to retest the record highs that we saw back in April. Um, that, that I think that seems more than a probable outcome given the fact that US yields are now below 1.5, US 10 yields are now below 1.5%. Now that we've seen that break below 1.5% and we've held below that. In the absence of a surprise, then I think the NASDAQ will start to play catch up with the S&P and start to set new record highs over the course of the next few weeks in what are likely to be fairly quiet summer markets. In the absence of bad news, generally markets tend to rise on inertia more than anything else. And as for Bitcoin, Bitcoin appears to be back in favour. There was some talk earlier this week 
that we might see um, a move below the 200 day moving average and a move below $30,000. We haven't as yet seen that. For stabilization, we need to move back above $40,000 um, back towards the levels that we saw in the middle of May. We haven't actually closed the gap quite yet with respect to this. Um, and as long as we hold above 30,000, then I would expect Bitcoin to start heading back higher again. That again is likely to be very choppy and very volatile over the course of the next few sessions. Brent crude has broken higher. Um, we've, 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 we've finally edged above those previous highs that I identified all the way back um, in 2019 and 2020, which would suggest that on a technical basis, we could well head back towards 73, 74, 75 dollars a barrel, um, but probably more on more as a symptom of a weaker dollar than anything else. Um, gold prices look as if they could well retest the highs of earlier this month, 1920. That's the next big resistance level. If you look at the the long shadows on these up candles here, it would appear to suggest that the bias is for a higher gold price. That will continue I think to be the case as long as US yields remain soft. If US yields start to head higher again you can see gold prices come under pressure but if 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 yields head back to 135 or 130 then gold really has to start heading back towards the highs that we saw earlier this year. Let's look at quickly look at Tesco's. Um, that's been an interesting chart over the course of the past six months and I know what you're going to say what happened with that big drop in February well that was quite simply a consequence of the five billion pound special dividend that um, Tesco issued to shareholders in the wake of selling its Asia businesses if you take five billion pounds out of the business the share price is going to drop it doesn't mean that the business is doing badly it just means that the business is worth less than it was um, in, in February. In terms of what we're expecting in, in terms of what we're expecting with respect to its first quarter numbers, I think um, the numbers look fairly positive. Um, what surprised me, I think, a little bit is why the shares haven't really made any progress since that first quarter. And I think one of the reasons for that was that management said that they expected sales volumes to decline as lockdown restrictions eased. However, to offset, offset that, costs were also expected to decline as well. So we'll see later this week whether or not that's translated into better margins. Obviously, I think the fact that the economy is reopening, more people are you know, basically getting outside, dining outside, having barbecues and what have you. You should see drink sales improve. You should see food sales improve. And as a consequence, I would, you know, I would be very surprised if the share price drops below the lows that we saw in early March, and we could well see a retest of that 240 level, um, which we last saw in the beginning of February. So those numbers are out on the 18th of June. Um, we've also got Whitbread Premier Inn's numbers. Um, they are also due out on the 17th of June and again these are first quarter numbers. Now when Premier Inn owner Whitbread reported its full year numbers it reported a loss of 635.1 million pounds at the end of April. Um, the shares did dip back briefly um, to the lows that we saw there but they've since rallied a little. Now they have found a little bit of a top in and around here but with the summer season getting in full swing and everyone having to stay at home, you've got to think that even if their city centre um, uh, venues struggle, um, their coastal venues should do very well indeed. And they, they you know, and the, the company's packaging of rooms on an individual basis supplemented with various meal deal opportunities ought to offer a decent platform at its more touristy locations to, to to offset any low occupancy rates in city centres. I mean, obviously, the reopening 
of theatres and cinemas in London and the West End will help if that in fact happens, because then it will be worth basically going for a trip into town and maybe staying at your, your premier inn um, in the city centres. But I think in terms of Q2, Q3, Q1, we're probably not going to see much of an improvement in the finances. The asset test will be Q2 and Q3 and see what revenue per room is as we head in to the summer months. Okay, so I think that's pretty much I think that's pretty much um, it for this week. Once again, thank you very much for listening. Till the same time, uh, same place uh, next week. I'd like to wish you all a nice weekend, a pleasant weekend. Hopefully, um, the weather will be nice, and I'll see you all the same time, same place uh, next week. Thank you very much for listening.